Actually, I'm going to be talking about C++ in the standard library. There's a whole set of changes coming to C++ the language as well for C++ 20 that I'm not going to be talking about here. Okay. Let's get started. First thing, because it's always about me all the time. Uh, my name is Marshall Clow. Uh, I've been working on libc++, the standard library implementation for LLVM for, oh, about nine years. Um, I've been, the, I am the co-donor for libc++, have been for about five. Um, I also chair the library working group in the C++ standards committee. Uh, the library working group is responsible for all the wording concerning the standard library, which is about a thousand pages of specification. And when I say I chair the library working group and the library working group is responsible for, I mean that exactly. I'm not responsible for that. I'm, I'm leading a group of people who are, or I'm not even directing, I am like coordinating a group of people who are working on this. Um, so I'm not trying to take this huge pile of credit here. I'm just saying that I work on this. Um, I work, my employer is the C++ Alliance, which is a US-based nonprofit organization. They're, uh, their goal in life is to promote the development of open source C++ libraries. There, end of commercial. <laughs> um, contact information is down below. Okay, I want to apologize in advance for this, uh, this talk because this is a 25 minute talk and really I could easily go three hours on things in the standard library for C++ 20. So this is going to be a very high level talk. It's going to be a lot of laundry list items where I'm just going to go down tick, 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 tick. And um, hopefully uh, I will whet your interest. Some of these things will, will pop up and say, oh, I didn't know about that. This is really cool. And uh, there'll be a couple links at the end where you can go get more information. So we'll start with, wait, C++ 20? I'm just like, just getting my head around C++ 14 and there's a 20? Um, so here's a brief history of, uh, or a list of C++ standard releases and planned ones. Um, the original standard release was 1998. 2003 was a very, very minor update. And then came the long death march that was coming up to C++ OX, which was supposed to ship in about 2007 or so, but waited and waited and, and dragged on and dragged on. And eventually became to C++ 11. Um, Nobody in the standards committee wants to repeat that. Nobody wants to repeat this many, many year struggle of trying to get something out the door, not quite sure when it's gonna happen or what's going to be in it. And so after that, there was a, uh, a policy change made, a goal to have regular, smaller releases of the standard. Um, and the goal is every three years. And we nailed that for 2014, and we nailed that for 2017, and it's looking very much like we will do that again next year in 2020. And then after that, there'll be another one, another release in 2013, or excuse me, 2023. And this is, this is all by a plan. Um, it's, it's basically, it's the, the uh, it's a good way to put it. The model that, uh, that Herb Sutter, who is the convener, uses is it's, it's a train model. The train's leaving every three years. The stuff that's ready that will, will be on the train. Stuff that's not ready, you know what? There's going to be another release in three years. And so it's, the idea is that you don't just shove stuff in because there's a release now. If it's ready, then we're good. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll wait. And this, uh, this actually happened to me. I had a uh, feature for the standard library that I thought was going to be in 2014 and we discovered at the last minute, it just wasn't quite right. It was not quite right. This turned out to this was the Boyer Moore searching algorithms, and the specification was not right. I had code that worked, I had implementation, I had users, but the specification did not actually say in sufficient detail what needed to be said so that other people could implement it. And so it ended up getting pulled back, and I reworked it, and it was in 2017. Um, so it's very much a, if something's ready, then, that, then it will go on that particular ship vehicle. Anyway, um, all right, on to the list. Uh, I want to call a distinction at this point between the, the, the core language and the standard library. They are not independent of each other, certainly, but in many ways they get developed independently but there's always features in the core language that affect the library, that enable new features in the library, 
Um, there's things that happen in the library that affects how the core language is, in fact, developed. And so um, when, I, when you, uh, you see some people talking, they talk about you know, language changes or library changes, and they're kind of independent. Anyway, major new library features frequently require core language changes. Um, and so we'll start with a list of um, new, new things that affect both the language and the library. Okay, big features for C++ 20, concepts. Concept was supposed to be the big feature for C++ 11, but we kept running into problems with implementation issues and problems with, we weren't sure how to specify things and so on. And so it was one of the reasons that C++ 11 took so long because concepts went in and people were not happy with the way they were specified and, the, and how you, people would use them and so they were pulled out. And this added probably two years to the C++ 11 development. Concepts are a set of both syntactic and semantic requirement or, uh, specifications on a type and or a series of types. And so you can say, as a shorthand, you can say that my type models this concept. And when you're specifying operations on a type, you say, I need a type that models this concept. Uh, we did a little bit of it. We did a lot of this actually before with type traits, but the type traits are very fine-grained. You can say, is something trivially copyable, right? Or does it have a member function named foo, or things like that? And concepts let you bundle a lot of this up into a much higher level um, way of programming, way of, excuse me, a much, higher, a much higher way of doing generic programming, sorry. Um, if you were in here for the last uh, talk, with um, Michael and Alex, they were talking about modules. Um, there's now a formal modules uh, specification in C++20. Um, it, people have been deploying various preliminary versions of this at Apple, at Google, at Microsoft. And so we have a fair amount of field experience in things that are similar to this. But uh, the, the actual details are fairly new and we're still feeling our way with that. Um, coroutines, we had a, um, had a, te a technical specification for coroutines. They were written by, um, by Gore from Microsoft and many other people. And um, that will be part of C++20. Loop C++ has had an implementation of the TS for now for about a year. Um, contracts, uh, one of the student papers here. Were people here for the talk yesterday morning about adding contract support to Clang? So, You've seen some of that stuff that basically the way of, um, if you remember Eiffel, how many people remember Eiffel, the programming language? Does anybody still use Eiffel? Just check in. No, I didn't think so. Um, but contract-based programming has been a very popular thing in, in circles for a long, in various programming circles for a long time, and it's coming to C++. We're going to have preconditions and postconditions and, um, and assertions that, are, that you can turn on and off at build time. Um, some of these preconditions and postconditions will be easy to check, and some of them are very, very hard to check. And so you have some fine-grained control. You say, I, I want to, gener I want to um, enable the cheap checks or the default checks, but not the expensive checks. And maybe sometimes you want to do the expensive checks. Um, an example of this, um, suppose you, have, you want to call a sorting algorithm. Right, with a custom comparison predicate. What are the requirements on the custom comparison predicate? It needs to impose a strict weak ordering on the things you're sorting. What does strict weak ordering mean? There's three conditions. It has to be, it has to be reflexive. Um, a cannot be less than A. It has to be symmetric. If A is less than A, A is less than B, then B cannot be less than A. I mean, they can both be, if A cannot be less than B and, and B cannot be less than A, say if A and B are equal, but only one of A less than B and B less than A can be true. And then there's transitive. A, if A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C. And um, so checking that is very straightforward. You just check it for all the input values that are in the thing you're sorting. But that's an n cubed operation. And you probably don't want to do that every time you call a sorting algorithm, which ought to be n log n. So that's an example of an expensive precondition check 
that you probably don't want to run very often. Uh, contracts. Um, consistent comparison, otherwise uh, sometimes called the spaceship operator because um, the, the operator we chose is less than equals greater than. So it looks like a flying saucer. Um, and this is a way of reducing a lot of boilerplate so that you can write, say, just equality and less than comparisons for your type or, or you know, a, a single set of comparisons and have all the rest of them synthesized for you. Um, Care8T is a new type. Um, it's a new character type, like Care16T and Care32T. It's uh, designed as a stepping stone towards Unicode, the big elephant in the room for C++. Unicode, what's that? We don't know anything about that. I can't imagine why, why can't we just use, you know, six-bit ASCII like God intended people to do? Just kidding. Um, anyway, um, Care8T uh, is a character type. You can get, you can get Unicode literals now, string literals, um, and also this affects the library because you have, we now have an 8-bit, a Care8T string class and stream classes. Now, this is not Unicode, because Unicode involves you know, combining characters and glyphs and, and all sorts of things like that that we're not doing yet, because it's a step, it's a baby step along the way. Anyway. Things that are in the library are the language that, that um, affect the library. Um, and then we have just a lot of, lot of new library features. Um, the big user of concepts in C++20 is the ranges library. Ranges are a different abstraction for dealing with sequences of elements. Instead of having a pair of iterators, you have this single uh, object called a range, which uh, which subsumes them both, but it also provides, because it's lazily evaluated and it's a single thing, you get a lot of new features. You can, you can pipe ranges together. You can take, say, I have, I have a container. I want a range that, that is all the values in this container, and I want to drop out all the odd elements, and then I want to sort them. And then I actually, excuse me, then I sort them, then I remove the unique, remove all the duplicates, and then I want to put the, that result and print it to a file. And that, you can do that in one line using the ranges library. Um, things like that. You can, you can join sequences together, you can split them apart. It's very, very powerful. And it's a, it's a much higher level way of, of dealing with sequences of elements, and processing sequence of elements than a pair of uh, iterators. Um, Chrono is, um, is the C++11 um, time manipulation library, part of the standard library, and we've extended it through a lot of work that Howard Hinant did uh, to involve, to be aware of time zones and calendars. And so you can do, you can do all sorts of things with it. Uh, my favorite is, I asked Howard a while back when he was developing this library, I said, I have a friend. He was born in 1954. He's, he's, he's older than I am. <laughs> I was not born in 1954. He was born in 1954 on such and such a date at such and such a time in Los Angeles. I said, I'd like to throw him a party, and being a geek, I want to throw him a party when he is 2 billion seconds old. Because I knew that was, you know, 62 years or something like that. He said, I said, when is that? And he sent me this little 10-line program. And you said, run this program. I ran this program. It said, August 2017, August 17th, 2017, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Pacific Daylight Time. And those are the kind of calculations you can do. Or how, how you know, what is 27 weeks from today? Or all those kind of things. And, you know, people who, calendar calculations are hard because they're, it's just full of all sorts of strange fiddly bits. I'm going to have to go faster. Um, more and more const expert, more and more, yes, more and more things in the standard library are now available at compile time. Um, the, the joke about chrono is that every single bit of chrono is now callable at compile time with one exception. And that is the call on your, on your system clock that says, what time is it right now? That's the only one that's not. All the, all the calculations, all these time zone calculations and the calendar calculations can be done at compile time. Um, Stud span is a, uh, 
is a class like string view, but not necessarily just for strings. You can say, I have a span of a chunk of, you know, an array in memory or a buffer in memory, and you can do object-based manipulations over it. It's a non-owning view into uh, some other memory. There's a whole pile of new atomic features. There's atomic shared pointers, atomic floating points, and an atomic ref. Um, I've kind of glumped them all together here, um, even though they're really not. They're, they're, their point of contact, their point of commonality is they're all in the atomic header. Uh, what else? Um, in C17, we got shared pointers to arrays. Now we have make shared for making shared pointers that say an array. Um, we have embraced some of the new C17 attribute syntax, um, like this. And we started putting no discard on things in the standard library. No discard means that if you, if you call a routine and you do not do anything with the, the return value, then you'll get a compile error saying, um, you didn't do anything with this return value. And this is a way of finding programming errors. The most common one is, what does, what does vector empty do? This is one of these things that people stumble over all the time. It tells you, it returns you a Boolean that tells you whether or not the vector is empty if the size of the vector is zero. Okay, that's all it does. The reason it's confusing to people because as they confuse it with vector clear, which makes the vector empty. And so we slapped a no discard on vector empty. So if you call and say, are you an empty vector, and then don't check the return result, you'll get a, you'll get a uh, warning because it ha this call has no side effects. It doesn't, it's a pure function. It doesn't do anything except return to this value. And if you, if you don't check the return value, why did you call it? Um, we've integrated a bunch of feature test macros into the working paper, WD, working draft. Um, so now you can check um, to see if any particular version of libc++ or some other standard library supports a particular feature. Um, we're kind of, I'm kind of sad about this because it's basically instituting the idea that we have incomplete implementations, but we do have incomplete implementations. Um, we have, we just added a very simple sounding call called std midpoint, where you take, give it two integers and it returns the value in the middle. This is surprisingly hard to get right. Um, I will have a whole talk about std midpoint and how hard it is to actually get it right. Um, at CPPCon in September. I mean, it's amazing that I could talk for an hour just on that one call. Um, it says that I tend to obsess over things, I think, more than anything else. Um, Erase-like algorithms now return useful information. The erase algorithms have always returned void. They don't do anything. They don't return any, any information to you. In C++20, they will now return to you the number of things that, that were erased. This is really useful for like erase if. I have a container. I want to erase all the odd numbers out of it. It says, okay, did that. How many were there? Oh, you didn't ask that. <laughs> so you, you can now get that information. Uh, we added a new header called version. Version is designed to be non-portable. In It's a portable way to discover non-portable information. Okay? It's where implementations will put implementation specific information. Like if you want to find out what standard library you're using, what the version of the standard library that you're using is, version is the place to go. You include that and then you start checking, you know, you say, is this libc++ or so on? And, and the way you do that, or is this lib, lib std c++ or is this the Microsoft visual, uh, the Microsoft standard library implementation? And how you do that checks, those checks are specific to the standard library implementation you're looking for but the place to get them is now always in version. Five minutes, okay, I've gotta go even faster. Um, boo -boo 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 -boo. String, I'm gonna start skipping things. Um, st string prefix and suffix checking, simple functions that, that, that are not really that hard to write, but might as well put them in the standard library because lots of people need them. Integral power of two operations. You know, is a number a power of two? 
Um, what's, the, what's the log of the base two of integral numbers, things like that. What's the ceiling and the floor for power of two numbers, all based on integers? Um, and endian, just endian is a, is a set of um, routines for managing big endian to little endian conversion, again, for integral types. Um, we added heterogeneous lookup for map and set in C++14, and now we've added that for the unordered containers as well. So, for example, if you have a map of strings to something and you have a character literal, you don't have to create a temporary string just to do the lookup. Um, you can check, now you can check for the existence of an element in the associated containers. You know, the associated containers are, are kind of odd when you kind of do, because when, when you do a lookup using the bracket operators in map, um, it creates the element there if, it doesn't exist. This is very handy, but if you just want to know what's there, you, you traditionally you've called find and then compared the result of this to the end iterator. Well, now we have a contains that just does that. Um, we also, in the, unordered, in the unordered containers, you can now pass in pre-calculated hash values. If you're going to look up something in several containers, you can calculate the hash, hash value once and use that. This is really handy if your hash function is expensive. If your hash function is cheap, it's probably not worth doing. Um, and you can also compare unordered containers for equality. Um, we also have a couple of new algorithms for shift left and shift right of a sequence to pick them and move them over. Um, this is the generalization of rotate or a simple, simpler case of rotate. Okay, and that's the end of my list. Um, the current status of these things, um, libc++ status page is up here. It has a list of all the features that have been approved for C++20 and in fact, have they been implemented and if they were implemented, what version of um, LLVM they, they showed up in at first. Um, sometimes they say nine, which means it'll be the next release. You know, a couple of them say even say six or seven. Um, there's also a corresponding page for Clang, which shows all this. Uh, this page shows the uh, the status of all the C plus plus twenty language features, and um, we have time for questions. We even have wow, we have like seven minutes for questions. Thank you, and again, I apologize for the briefness of this. It was. Um, I could have I could have done this for two hours. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Any questions? Please uh, step up to the microphones. Yes. <laughs> um, do you have features in the library for which you added some new interesting things in Clang to I'm, be able to implement them? I'm sorry. I missed the first part of what you said. Do you have some features in the standard library for which you implemented some new features in Clang to be, be to be able to better implement them? So like uh, intrinsics or like uh, new uh, optimization passes or anything? Did you, make, did you need to make okay. change to the, to the compiler itself to implement mm -hmm. some features? Yeah, some of, the, some of the new features in the library do absolutely depend on, uh, on compiler features. And so we won't get them in libc++ until Clang is, is up to date. Yeah, that was not my question. It was more like, do you have some features that don't depend on compiler features? Yes. But you still change the compiler to be able to implement them in a better way? But we still change, uh, okay, the second, the first half of this, we certainly have features that don't, comp don't, don't depend on the compiler. We will go ahead and implement those. But um, sometimes when we're implementing those, I, I'm going to answer what I think your question is, and you'll tell me if not. Sometimes when we implement those, we might find deficiencies in the compiler or things in the compiler that would make this better. And yes, we'll, we feed those back to the... Um, and do you have an to, example of something like that that you did for C++20? Um, we, we did that actually with the, the, the std midpoint. It turned out that implementing midpoint well involved changing the compiler. I mean, it wasn't a feature, it was a, it was a code gen feature, basically. It was generating better code, because what we wanted to do was we wanted to generate, have midpoint be a very small, fast um, function that had no branches in it. And we managed that for ints and longs and, and so on, but not for cares. And it turned out that 
there was there was some missing functionality in in Clang that has since been fixed. Thank you. So so yes, developing a standard library, adding new features to the standard library is frequently this dance between the compiler and the uh, and the standard library to do a really good job. That's that's what you want. Okay, is that was that your question? Great. Somebody over here? Yes. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Very interesting. What C would be the best way to start like getting involved with libc++? Is there a way to find like tasks that are suitable for entry? Um, so the best way to get involved with with uh, libc++ is to um, look at this list. Look at this list and send me some email saying, "Hey, how, how would you feel if I would like to work on this?" or um, or Go look at the bugzilla and say, oh, yeah, this bug is awful. I think I know how to fix this. Um, but basically, we, um, yeah, we're always looking for more help. Uh, li working in the standard library, there's a barrier to entry because it's, I don't want to, I don't want to say special place because, you know, there are lots of, lots of intricate places. But the, the, the standard library works under a set of restrictions, which I think is unique. And it takes a, it takes a few tries to, to internalize what all those are. For example, if you've ever looked at the libc++ source code, you write, it's really ugly, okay? It's got underscores everywhere, and all the names are just bizarre. And there is a reason for that. It's not just because I'm a really twisted guy. And, and you, have to, you have to know the reasons behind it, which I'll happily tell you. And, and then it's just following a set of guidelines. Um, we recently actually picked up uh, a new contributor to libc++, and I was quite surprised to discover that she's a sophomore in high school. <laughs> um, but in any case, yes, if you would like to help work, work on libc++, please drop me a line. Um, okay, mcloudlists at gmail.com, and we do all our we do all our reviews on Fabricator like the rest of LLVM, so. Thank you again for the talk. Um, are there plans to be more aggressive with feature deprecations in the future? Getting I'm sorry, more order. aggressive with what? More aggressive with deprecations. With so annotations? deprecating features in the library and in the standard. <laughs> yeah, it's for some reason I'm, I'm missing a word out of what you said, so okay. I'm not sure. So, um, deprecations? Oh, deprecations, thank you. I thought you said annotations, and I was saying, they're more aggressive with deprecations. Um, yes, there are plans for that. The problem is, is that every time we, tr we, we mark things for deprecations and things start warning, we get pushback from people who are like, it's still there, it's, it's still useful, um, and, and I, like to, I like to run with errors, warnings as errors. So it's, it's a pain point for some people. Um, we, deprecations and flat out removals. I mean, we, in C++ 17, I removed auto pointer, right? If you're building for 17 or 20, there is no auto pointer. Now there's a, there's a flag that you can turn to get it back. And I would like to do more of that. I would like to get to the point where as things are removed, as things are deprecated, you know, we mark them up. But, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's two steps forward, one step back because this causes pain for people, and I'm, I, I don't like causing them pain, but at the same time, you know, I'm trying to encourage them to update their code bases. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, anybody else? Because we are just about out of time. Yep, I have some questions, but uh, thank you very much, Marshall. Yep, thank you.